you'll find Mr. John Everson and our next guest, Mr. Phil McCoy, as we are joined by co-hosts Bill Stubblefield and John Gilstrap. Philly, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, guys. How are you all? We're well, just splendid. I mean, we're, we're, <laughs> that we're, enthusiasm. Gilstrap's leaving after today. He's gone for like three weeks. <laughs> We're just in such a good mood over it. We just can't can't possibly top this day. Can you feel the love tonight? You know, it's, <laughs> it's just him. You know, we're just rolling in it right now, Phil. Uh, Steelers 3-0, and baby. How about that performance yes, yesterday, are. man? Yes, they are 3-0. and I'd like, to, I'd like to know where Mr. Hornby is this morning. I don't know if he's licking his wounds or if he's listening or looking for excuses, but that was a huge win yesterday against a good football team, and that offense showed up. And boy, it reminded me of the good old days with Jerome Bettis, where we just ground out that clock and scored a touchdown in the second half and wouldn't give it back. So it was a good day for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Happy weekend. Hornby, awesome. who's a Chargers fan from his time living in California, was in here last Monday just talking trash on me, telling me about how the Chargers running game couldn't be stopped and the Steelers had no chance yeah, I- in that game. Yeah, I saw him at a volleyball match, and I didn't talk to him much, but he, he mentioned briefly, he started talking about the Chargers. And I always forget that. I've never met a Chargers fan before, uh, before <laughs> Horman. So when I talk to him, I always forget that he's a Chargers fan. Well, I don't know what happened to him. He yeah. reminded me last week, that's for sure. Yeah, Harris ran wild, at least the second half. Is he that good, or is your, just the line, offensive line dominated? I think it's a combination I think, of both. Uh, yeah, I think it's a combination. And O line, I don't think looked that great in the first half, but uh, but Harris runs hard, man. I I really like him as a running back. His his numbers don't say that he's one of the best backs in the league. But up until this year, until Frazier and some of these rookies, I mean, Zach Frazier is an absolute animal. And as a rookie coming in from WVU second round pick, he is an absolute animal. He's changed that offensive line. But the uh, up until this year, he's had a subpar offensive line and still put up good numbers. But he runs hard. He's a punishing runner. That's what we need in Pittsburgh. They're talking about Zach Frazier as already being one of the best centers in football three games into his career. Yeah, that's, that's a lot to say. But he has, he has been a bright spot for the first three weeks of the season. I mean, you watch them, and there's, there's nothing given up in the middle of that uh, offense. And he just seems to be just a, a workman type personality he doesn't he doesn't make any dumb mistakes i probably jinxed him for next week but he doesn't make any dumb mistakes and he's just he he's just not there and, and that's what you want with an offensive lineman you don't notice him much because he's doing his job and another wvu player beanie bishop uh, who i think he started at slot corner the first game and continues to get a little playing time so wvu uh, a couple of players there contributing to the steelers which is uh, i'm sure good of local interest there's a lot of steeler fans around here especially around morgantown yep and zach frazier is from west virginia as well so not only did he go to wvu but he's from west virginia which is i find uh, i find even more reason to cheer for and speaking of that that's long been a complaint of WVU coaches over the years not giving West Virginia kids scholarships. Now, clearly, there's you have to go outside the state to recruit. It's a small state. But there's evidence at times, and I've heard this from other people, that at WVU they just pretty much ignore the local population and, and just focus out of state on recruiting. And I think of that, that, that the Tyson Bajant situation, and there's a guy good yeah. enough to, to play in the NFL but not good enough to get a scholarship to WVU. Uh, you got a wide receiver, Hudson Clement, at West Virginia who had a pretty strong game over the weekend. He had to walk on yeah. and eventually earn a scholarship at WVU. And this has been, been a complaint. Uh, I've been working in this town since 1990, and it's been a complaint that was around since before then. I, I think sometimes you got to start to – Focus a little bit on some of the local kids who are good ball players. Well, not all they I, shouldn't always yeah. have to earn it through a walk on status. I remember I know, the aren't think, remember the aren't brothers. They went to WV yeah. one WVU right. One of them, Darren, I think. Well, one of the first interior linemen two years ago in the draft was we forget about this was a draft pick from Tennessee that went to high school in Huntington, and I don't know what uh, he was. He went number thirteen, I think, overall in the first. I believe the first interior lineman, not tackle, but interior lineman drafted. And if I remember correctly, and if I'm wrong on this, I apologize, but I was reading where he wanted to go to WVU, but they wanted him to walk on. 
So instead, he accepted his full SEC scholarship out of state. And I wonder if what, they're, what they hope to do is because it costs a West Virginia kid less money to get in and then there's the promise scholarship if they're saying hey we don't have to give these west virginia in-state west virginia kids money it's not that much for them to get in anyway maybe financial aid in some cases i'm not quite sure but uh, i've heard that quite often and, and a lot of stories where they overlook west virginia kids simply because they're from west virginia but but nonetheless zach frazier and i don't know his deal when he went to west virginia he'd walk on i have no idea but he's killing it right now uh, A.R. Emmert says Darnell Wright of Huntington. That's the guy you're talking about. Yes. Yep, that's yes. the name. Uh, Ken Madsen said he can't wait. He can't wait until the Steelers <laughs> go on a five-game losing streak. Phil, he's <laughs> a Ravens Ken fan, Madsen by the way. Needs to get. To, oh, what happened to you, Ken Madsen, to make you a Ravens fan in your youth? <laughs> I don't know what would cause something like that to happen, but you need to come on over. We'll save a few seats on the bus on the Steeler bus for you, for you and Dylan and a lot of others. But it's looking like a good good season. And the I, I don't know why you would come at us like that. We've done nothing to the Ravens other than beat them every time we play. <laughs> you just you just motivated Dylan to put his headsets on. <laughs> well, you, I think Get your headset off, Dylan. <laughs> you were baiting Dylan on that one. Yeah. All I'll say is saying that Cowboys didn't win this uh, yesterday, did they? No, they did not. No. Ravens got one. Well, they made it close, though, didn't they? They they did their best. To, you know, they're just not allowed. They they want to keep things interesting, you know. They they don't want to let the Ravens fans go to go to bed early or anything like that, go away from the TV early. It's that, like, hey. That, that was interesting. They had, a, they had a big uh, big third down conversion there in the fourth quarter late to, to put that one away. So what a game that was. That's a big win. You win at Dallas. That's a big win. Yeah. Phil, let's talk a little bit of money. Money, money, money here on the program because we had that rate cut since we last spoke with you. Uh, you were thinking a quarter percent. By the time they made that cut, I had heard in the survey that they thought there was a 61% chance it would be a half percent cut, half percent. and it was. Yes, it was. And I didn't think it would be. You know, I thought I was wrong. But they did. The peculiar thing to me was, and I guess now hindsight's always twenty twenty. What was surprising is Tyler yelled across because I had forgotten. I was I was working and I'd forgotten about it was it was at two o'clock. Tyler yelled out and said half a percent. And I thought he was joking. And I went and looked and I was like, Oh, there it is, half a percent. And my expectation was was to see some volatility. I didn't know which way. Would half a percent cheer us on and say, Hey, it's time to buy some equities now, here's a half a percent cut that's gonna motivate the economy, or would that half a per percent cut say, oh, the Fed thinks something's up, there's something dark in the waters, that's why they're doing half a percent. But for that day, nothing happened. Nothing major happened, either good or bad. Really, really, really confused me. So next day on Thursday, that's when we got the huge jump. I mean, that was a super good day on Thursday. But then it came into the picture became clear because of the weekly jobless claims. We needed to see some sort of support that the labor market wasn't in ter a terrible danger, and that wasn't why they did the half a percent cut. So after that weekly jobless report came in and met expectation, I think it was a little bit better than expectations, then that was the green light for our markets to take off. And that little synopsis, I think, is something that we'll probably go through through the rest of 2024 as we look at the labor market, because right now that is the focus of the Fed is to ensure that our labor market remains healthy now, not that they've given up the battle with inflation, but they've said, hey, inflation is in check, and it's on its way to where we want to go. And, and John Gilstrap and I both have said for a long time, why don't you just stop at 2.5% and let that be the target? Well, they've taken the foot off the gas at around 2.5%, and hopefully they're hoping that it coasts to 2%. But we'll still look at these same reports that we've been looking at for the last three years. And remember, the Federal Reserve's mandate is labor market and inflation, and they're not supposed to care about anything else. So those two those two uh, readings on the, our economy will drive what they do moving forward, but it's expected that there's going to be a quarter of a percent in November and a quarter of a percent in December. And stop me if you haven't heard this before, but that will be data dependent, depending upon what labor market reports and inflation reports look like before we get there. 
Phil, we hear so much about the, uh, uh, even though inflation has slowed, the prices are much higher than were in prior to pre-COVID. The only way to get them back down to COVID, pre-COVID days was uh, something or some process of deflation. How damaging yes. would deflation be to our country, our economy? It's extremely damaging. So while we think as consumers that we want deflation, we don't. And sometimes we confuse with slowing inflation and deflation. We don't want deflation as the overall. Now, you want, you'll want you see it in some, in some products or some sectors, but you do not want to see overall deflation. And without going down a rabbit hole, because I tend to do that sometimes talking about this, look no further than Black Friday. And I use this as an example a lot. Black Friday, of course, that's the, what, the day after Thanksgiving, and, we, and all, everything goes on sale. And we always ask ourselves, why does everything, like now there's a sale before Black Friday, and then there's a sale before that. Well, the reason being is when we as consumers believe that prices will be lower in the near future, we refuse to buy because of that. So we'll wait for those prices to drop. And if deflation occurs all throughout our economy, history has shown it causes consumers, even those with the ability to buy, to stop. They're not going to buy until prices stop dropping. And that's very difficult to get out of is that cycle of deflation that is very, very difficult to stop. So that is one thing the Federal Reserve most certainly does not want is deflation. They want the rate of inflation to slow. Now, having said that, that means prices will likely never go back down as an overall. Now, there'll be some. You'll see some in housing and in insurance and used cars and new cars. And so you'll see some pieces of that basket that they measure that will deflate. But as an overall, we do not want to see deflation. I'm convinced that so long as gasoline prices come down, people, generally speaking, have a better outlook and a better view of the economy. When gasoline prices go up to four bucks a gallon, it starts to freak people out. So you, if you can keep them, when they drop, people feel a lot better. And then if you can get food prices to come down some too, that also helps their outlook. Every, everything else you can kind of like build that in to what you can tolerate. But when you're going to the supermarket and you're spending two hundred dollars for what you used to spend one hundred and twenty-five on, and when you're paying four four and a half bucks a gallon to fill up, that wears on you because you do that kind of stuff so often. You only buy a car every so many years. You only buy a house every so many years. But that stuff you have to buy a couple times a week or whatever, going to the supermarket, going to the, the gas station, that gets you. The gas, uh, Rob, gas you see in in display what it is. Food prices are much more subtle. Mm -hmm. You kind of baked in that the food prices have gone up. That had to go down quite significantly before you get get past that image. But they that should come down because one of the things everybody hid behind when gasoline prices went up was, well, food, you have to truck the food in, so that's the reason why it costs more. Okay, well, gas prices have come down like a buck a gallon over the last year. Can they get a, a similar reduction in price at the supermarket? Is that possible, Phil? I mean, they blamed uh, it on high fuel prices. It's possible, but not probable. And that's the same thing that we look at when interest rates go up or down. You know, when interest rates go up, I remember talking with you many times, and why don't they, what they're giving us on our savings rate or time deposits at the bank, how come those rates don't go up immediately? But when interest rates go down, those time deposits come down immediately. The rates that you pay on maybe on your autos or your credit cards, they don't go down immediately. They'll go down a little bit slower, but when rates come up, uh, they they tend they do go up almost immediately. So it's no different in the grocery stores where they're not going to come down in lockstep with the price of of uh, uh, transportation. But they, eventually they should slow and come down a little bit, just depending on what that product is. I, I was getting a good rant together there for a moment, Phil, about food prices and being gasoline dependent. You you stopped me from it, which is good. Thank you. Good, John. No, I just want to interrupt the happy dance a little bit. The for some perspective, when when all this started, right, money was free, and then with the various increases, I I lost track. What what did the rate top out at? The prime rate. Uh, the prime rate. I think it was at five five point five to five sixty five. Okay, so now we've had a half point. It's brought it down to five percent, right? Yes. And now we're really happy that everything is is increased by 
like you can't actually calculate off of zero. So um, by, by infinity percent increase from, from where it started. So how long is this going to, and, and we're surprised the prices aren't, aren't coming back down. Of course they're not coming back down because everything is still no. so much more expensive than, than it was when the whole thing started. No, my, my complaint about the prices not coming down is that supermarket prices, when they jacked them up, they said, well, it's because it costs so much in fuel to get them here. Well, fuel prices have come down significantly in the last year. Oh, so therefore, if that was your excuse for raising prices, then you should be lowering them. That's politicians seeking cover. That's, of course. Well, looks, that wasn't politicians. That was the people that own the supermarkets. It, it's 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 everybody's everybody's seeking cover. Everybody's lips are moving. I'm the, aware the reality of that. is yes. So so what's happening is I'm calling out the hypocrisy. I good for you because I I think we should. They needed time to get smaller boxes that they could fill with few less stuff, which they still, did. Still leave a, a lot of air in in, yeah. in the top. Just so, like just like this show. <laughs> The boxes remain the same. <laughs> Inflation went up, so we put more air on the show. So, how long does this take for for any of the 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 rate cuts for uh, car loans to become less expensive, or or uh, house loans become less expensive? Uh, the housing loans, I think that that happened fairly quickly. As it with car loans, I don't know that it would be an immediate half a percent cut. Most of those are done based off of a daily or weekly movement it's not going to be in lockstep with what the federal reserve just cut but it will be uh it should be fairly immediate i've already seen some ads that rates have already come down on on mortgages but they're still high in relationship to everything else they're just lower or not everything else than what they were in the past they're just lower than what they were before but that you know that that idea that we have and, and that's what this whole discussion is about is the rate of inflation and john you point that out all the time you're 100 percent correct it just means prices are still going up but they're going up slower but the downside to that is just as as bill had mentioned as a as an entirety we may want one item to go down or we, or we may want to see two items go down but as a consumer whether we believe it or not we do not want to see deflation run throughout our entire economy we do not want to see that because deflation is dangerous to to an economy and it's very difficult to uh, to buck that trend and, and get out of that then we start to look back and say well i'm not going to buy this because i remember how cheap it was i'm going to wait and even if deflation stops i'm going to wait until it comes back down it just kind of puts a pause on the overall consumer when we need consumers to spend money we need regardless of what inflation looks like we need consumers to spend money so deflation is dangerous we do want to again we may not believe it as consumers but we want to see the rate of inflation slow we don't want to see deflation phil with the uh the fed cut the five percent cut uh or five tenths of percent cut uh we think of the mortgages and the big ticket items but the big one of the big benefic uh, benefactors would be credit cards. When do we expect to see lower interest rates on credit cards? That would be the same thing. So for your best of the best consumers, you'll see that immediately. And, and I know this would make a lot of listeners mad, but the best of the best consumers, if you have that best rate credit card or if you're applying for a credit card and you have that 800 score and have a really solid income, you're going to see that immediately. They're trying to attract you. But for that subprime or maybe that consumer that doesn't have the best credit rating or doesn't have the best uh, debt-to-income ratio, you'll see that much, much slower simply because they don't want to open the door and let, it, let an iffy debt in their door. And if rates, if they stop decreasing rates or, God forbid, have to increase rates yet again, they don't want to get trapped with someone that may not be the best at paying their bills and now I've given them a lower rate, and I can, and rates are much higher than that now. So they're going to be much slower for that consumer, the consumer that needs it most. It'll be much slower for that consumer. By the way, the, the mortgage rates are more tied to the 10-year Treasury, as I understand it, Phil, as opposed to the prime rate, yes. correct? Well, yes. I mean, the prime rate just starts everything. And then, you know, based off of uh, who it is and what credit rating you have, you start with the prime rate and then the overnight banking rate and then, and the banks charge each other, and then you just go from there, and it continually goes up until you get to consumers. 
do people with 800 credit scores have credit card debt? Uh, they may have debt that, like, they use credit cards throughout the month. Well, then you pay, pay them off, off at the end, right? Yes, you pay it off at the end. But, yeah, you can have credit card debt and still have an 800 credit score. It just depends yeah. on how much credit card debt that you have. You know, if you have a $50,000 limit and you typically carry a $2,000 balance, it's not going to hurt your credit score. But as to, as to your point, though, those with 800, 830 type credit uh, credit scores, they typically go ahead and, and pay that $2,000 off as well. So credit card companies look at those people and they say, hey, we're not going to make any interest off of them anyway. We need to attract those customers to spend so then there's those transaction fees that occur at the gas pump or at the grocery store or at the hotels or travel. We want their transaction fees. We're not going to make interest off of these people anyway. So therefore, we can go ahead and lower that rate and, and rely on the transaction fees. Which brings up the question in our consumer economy, if Americans across the board lived within their means, would our economy crash? <laughs> That's a good question. And it's one I don't want to know the answer to, but I fear that if all Americans lived within their means, at least for a short period of time, there'd be a huge reset. And we probably would ha have an issue for quite some time. And then we would have to spur them on again to spend some money. But that's a very, very good point. That you, that you make there, John. If everybody in the United States or across the world, for that matter, we need someone to live outside their means. But if, if they did that for, say, a year, there would be a hard reset to our economy, and it would be painful. Yes, well, know, I, I think I, that's I a, fair, a good question, I, and I think, yes, it would do harm, and we saw evidence of that. I think it would, too. A couple of different occasions. George Bush back in, what, 20-something years ago, and they did that. Uh, there was a quick refund that they did in your... Uh, to everybody, I, I don't remember what the circumstances were, but everybody got a check for a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, six hundred dollars per and they child. They didn't spend it, and they didn't spend it. Yes. And they complained about that. They didn't. Spend but it. but then they yep. complained that the nation's savings rate is too low too. So, Phil, getting away from the uh, the cut from the Federal Reserve uh, over the weekend, we heard that the Congress are probably come to an agreement with a new government funding bill. Is that going to impact the market at all? I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't think so, Bill. Because it, I hate to say this, but our markets. Every time we look at the government funding bill and the the potential for government to shut down, our markets just see it as white noise because it happens so often that they don't put much faith into, they don't put much stock into it. They just assume that they're going to come up with something or they're going to come up with something at the final hour. So neither n n neither good nor bad. I don't think it will impact our markets at all right now because the assumption was they would have come up with something anyway. Nothing to follow there, Bill? No, no, I, I was sure? just curious. I, I, t I tend to agree with you, but I, 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 a kind of related question is for the last several months or years, the swings in the market have been so extreme. Uh, when will we get back to the uh, where there's more moderation uh, in the swing? Seems like very little takes it off to get uh, to lose four or five hundred or gain three or four hundred. I, I don't think uh, that's coming back, and quite honestly, and I think the 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 uh, use of technology, how quickly we receive news, how we all overreact to any bit of news that we get, uh, is is the blame for that. When you look at it on an annual basis or a three-year or five-year, ten-year basis, it still kind of looks the same. But as you go through, like you had just mentioned, weekly, monthly, daily moves, I think that volatility is here to stay, and it's only going to get worse simply because of how quick we get information. Uh, we're headline readers. All of us, I'm guilty of it as well, and taking a story and running with it. And people are, in some cases, buying and selling based off of this blurb in the on the on the internet that we may read and in some cases even fake news or a misleading headline right. so i don't think it's going away at all i think it's going to get worse pay attention more to the percentage than the number because as the numbers get higher on the indices yes. the numbers as they move get bigger too right. phil how do we reach yes. you for more information today you can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 winchester avenue Right here, Martinsburg. Have a great day, Phil. Thank you, guys. Go Steelers. Mm -hmm.